Let's open up in a word of prayer. Gracious God, our King, Father, thank you for these who have shown up this morning. Help us, Father, to glorify you in what we do and what we say. Father, as we continue our study through the book of Revelation, help us to understand the magnitude and the glory of what your victory in the end will mean to us. Help us, Father, to understand your word more and more every day. In Christ's name, amen. I have a Bible somewhere. Huh? All right, how's everybody's week been? Pretty much. Everybody's having car wrecks. Rachel totaled her car. Y'all totaled yours. Gavin. We're going to take... No. Oh, yeah. We're going to take Gavin's motorcycle away. Yeah, Gavin dumped his bike. How's the bike? Did you see it? Did you see it? Okay. You didn't laugh at him, did you? No, I sure did. Okay. All right. Revelation chapter 13. Anybody got any questions about Revelation chapter 12 that we talked about last week? Well, I'm sure you do. Okay. Well, I don't know how to take that, but okay. All right. I'm going to talk about the first beast and the second beast. And if you'll recall that I said that part of what's going on during the tribulation period, Satan knows his time is short. And Satan's ultimate goal all along has been to be worshipped. Satan wants to be worshipped as God is worshipped. So Satan is creating a false trinity here on earth to compete with the, the trinity in heaven. So Satan is going to create a false trinity. He's going to, Satan cannot create. All, the only thing that Satan can do is mimic. He can copy and mimic. And so that's what he's trying to do. He creates a false. Sorry. That's all right. There's a, there's a lot going on right now, so we'll wait just a minute. We're going to have a building one day. We're going to have a building one day. And it, some, we'll have a building and this won't happen. When my two oldest were little, toddler-like, one of their presents somebody gave them was fireman's hats. It had a real siren on top and the light and everything. I was so happy when them things broke. Anyhow, you never got one. Hallelujah. All right, so... We're going to talk about the false trinity that Satan sets up. Verse 1 of chapter 13, And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems on its horns, and blasphemous names on its head. And the beast I saw was like a leopard, its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it the dragon gave his authority and his throne and great authority. Who's the dragon again? Satan, right? Satan is the dragon. We found that out last week. Now, if you'll look back in Daniel chapter 7, we're not going to turn there, but you can turn there later. Daniel chapter 7 is, is where Daniel is given a vision, a prophecy 
of the world kingdoms to come. Daniel, of course, lived during the, the Babylonian Empire. He was one of the captives that were brought to Babylon when the Babylonians took over the nation of Israel. And so Daniel lives during Nebuchadnezzar's time. Daniel lives during the Babylonian Empire. The Babylonian Empire in the vision that Daniel was given in cha Daniel chapter 7 is likened to a lion. Following the Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persians supplanted the Babylonians. If you look back in history, this is what happened. The Medo-Persian Empire conquered the Babylonian Empire and took their place, and they are likened to a bear. And then the Greeks came under Alexander the Great and kicked out the Medo-Persians. They defeated the Medo-Persians, and it became a Greek empire. And the Greek, in Daniel's vision, in Daniel chapter 7, is likened to a leopard. So what John is seeing is the succession of world history backwards. Daniel is seeing it forwards, and John reverses the order of these animals because he's seeing it backwards. He's seeing from what we have now in, Dan in John's time, which is a Roman Empire, to which... Daniel couldn't describe the Roman Empire, and neither does John, because it's something that humankind had never seen before. The power and might of the Roman Empire was, was different from anything. But anyhow, what this is saying is, throughout, throughout human history, Satan has been using great empires to try to accomplish his purpose and his will, which his ultimate purpose is to thwart the coming of the Messiah, Right? That's why he used the successive empires to try to destroy the Jews. God protected them, however. But, and I saw a beast rising out of the sea. Sea is Gentile nations. That's what it stands for. With ten horns, total power, and seven heads. Got some supernatural wisdom head uh, going on there. With ten diadems on its horns and its blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard, its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to the dragon, to it the dragon gave his authority, his throne, and great authority. So Satan has given his authority to mankind's efforts, specifically the Gentile efforts, to be world rulers. These world empires is what we're talking about. And so verse 3, one of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. Turn over to Zechariah 11. We're drilling down now to the Antichrist. My pages are sticking together. Zechariah 11. Come on. There we go. Verse 17 of Zechariah 11 is a prophecy about the worthless shepherd or the Antichrist. Woe to my worthless shepherd who deserts the flock. May the sword strike his arm and his right eye. Let his arm be wholly withered, but his, his right eye utterly blinded. It's a prophecy that the Antichrist will seemingly survive, maybe in an assassination attempt is what it indicates. He will seemingly be resurrected from the dead. Not in totality, but he will seemingly be resurrected from the dead. Remember that Satan is trying to imitate the Trinity. He's trying to imitate the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, what happens to the Son? He's, he dies on the cross, he's buried, and he's resurrected. Satan wants to imitate that. So his Antichrist, the one who is playing the role of Christ in Satan's false trinity, is also going to seemingly be resurrected from the dead. However, that is accomplished. He's going to suffer blindness in his right eye and his right arm is going to be withered. He's going to be injured somehow and miraculously, it seems to the world, survive. Right? He becomes the darling of the whole world and he has come upon the scene, remember, bringing peace. He's the rider on the white horse bringing peace and he conquers 
not by war but by peace, by making a peace treaty with the nation of Israel and solving, seemingly to solve that whole Middle Eastern problem that has been, been going on and boiling around over for decades and decades and generations. He has the answers to everything. The rapture of the church has happened and the world is thrown into turmoil and he comes on the scene and has an explanation and seemingly has the explanation and the answer for every problem that is plaguing mankind. And then there's an assassination attempt and his right eye is damaged. He's blinded in his right eye and his right arm is withered. So <coughs> he has a false resurrection. One of the heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. The whole earth is marveling at the, the survival of this man. And they worshiped the dragon. Again, who's the dragon? Satan. What has Satan's purpose been all along? He wants worship. He wants to be worshiped as God, right? So through his Antichrist, they're worshiping the dragon who gives the Antichrist his power. They're worshiping that, the dragon because the Antichrist is his creature, his creation. Uh, he worshiped the dragon for he'd given his authority to the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast and who can fight against it? And the beast, the beast is the Antichrist, this is the first beast, and the beast was giving them out, uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation, and all who dwell on earth will worship it. Anyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to be taken captive, that captivity goes. If anyone is to be slain with a sword, with a sword must he be, sword must he be slain. Here is a call for endurance and faith on the saints. So God is going to allow the Antichrist to make war on the saints, on the believers, those believers who have come to faith in Christ during the tribulation period because remember the church is raptured. At chapter 4, church is never mentioned again until we get ready to end the book. The church is in heaven. Right? These are the, the believers who have come to know Christ during the tribulation period. Perhaps the rapture was the, was the trigger that, that tipped the scale, was the evidence that they needed. Because we all know people who, who say, well, if there was only some more evidence, if I could just be sure, if there was more evidence, I would believe. Well, okay, all of the Christians have suddenly disappeared. Mm, that might, that's, and then we've got the two witnesses proclaiming the gospel in Jerusalem and on television and we got an angel flying through the sky crying the gospel out to everybody they cannot they cannot say there is no evidence because all the evidence anyone will need is going to be evident is going to be plain in the tribulation period so people bottom line my point being and we'll talk about that in a bit my point being you have to make a conscious choice during the tribulation period. Humankind has to make a conscious choice in the tribulation period which one they're going to go with. Are they going to go with the, with the beast, with the dragon, or are they going to go with God? Nobody is going to say, I don't have the knowledge. They make a conscious choice. They make a decision on who they want to worship. Right? And it reveals the evil that lurks within humankind. Because the vast majority of people choose to worship the beast. Right? When we talk about the number of the beast, you either get it on your forehead or your right hand. It's a conscious choice. Right? I, don't listen to them people say, oh, no, these microchips, that's the mark of the beast. No. The mark of the beast is something you consciously choose to take. You know exactly what you're doing. You are proclaiming your allegiance to Satan and the Antichrist. That's what it is. It's a visible mark that you belong, that he, you have chosen against God and chosen for Satan. You have chosen a side. You have taken a side, and the side you have taken is the one that's going to lose. But that's what human, humanity does. So, that's the Antichrist, the first beast. Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. That means he more than likely is going to be Jewish. 
Remember, the first beast comes out of the sea. He's Gentile. Second beast comes out of the earth. Typically, prophetically speaking, symbolically speaking, the seas stand for the Gentile nations and the earth stands for the Jewish nations. That's not a hard and fast rule, but that's what it seems to be indicating here. Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. So this is who we call the false prophet. So the false trinity is the dragon, Satan, uh, the first beast, the Antichrist, and the second beast, the false prophet. Right? The false prophet is stepping into the role, playing the role of the Holy Spirit. He causes people to worship people and people to the first beast, the Antichrist. Just as the Holy Spirit's role in the present age is to point people to Christ, the false prophet is pointing people to the Antichrist. So this is Satan's trinity, the first and the second beast. So seems to be a religious man, had two horns like a lamb, but it spoke blasphemous things. It spoke like a dragon. So the Antichrist comes on the scene as a religious leader pointing people to worship the first beast, which is the Antichrist, and consequently, as they worship the first beast, they worship Satan. So he's pointing to the worship of Satan. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal womb was healed. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. So Satan has it doing what the... what. If you, do you remember during the Exodus when Moses and Aaron goes to, before Pharaoh and they start doing these signs that God tells them to do, right? Moses lays down his stick and it becomes a snake. And Pharaoh's position, uh, magicians do the same thing. They lay down their sticks and they somehow become a snake. Moses' is snake, uh, snake from the stick eats all the other ones and then it becomes a stick again. My point being that Satan has mimicked God's mighty powers in the past. Satan has some power. We don't know what's going on in the spiritual realm because we can't, we, can't, we can't step into those dimensions right now. We don't know how in those dimensions you can manipulate things. We don't know, but for some reason, by some means, Satan's false prophet is allowed to bring fire from heaven. Just what, the, right? just what Elijah did, just what the two uh, witnesses are doing in Jerusalem. He's mimicking these miracles. It performs great signs, verse 13, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. So he tells them, he t has them create an idol. He has them create an idol of the beast so that they worship the beast. Right? Go back to Daniel and see what Nebuchadnezzar does. Why does Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego end up in the fiery furnace? Oh, Nebuchadnezzar made a statue of himself. He, they talked him into doing, making a statue of himself, and everybody was supposed to worship him. And the three Hebrew boys refused to do so. So they were tossed in the fiery furnace. Satan's playbook all along has been the very same thing. He wants to be worshipped. And we'll see that this worship of the Antichrist in this picture of this thing, ultimately Satan gets tired of not being the, the, ob, the sole object of worship and he takes over and demands worship openly for himself. Uh, verse 15. And it, it was the image, and, well, no, excuse me, and it was allowed to give breath. So the second beast is allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might, image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. And it also causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, that is, the name of the beast or the number of his name. This calls for wisdom. Let one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666, or 666, literally, is what it reads. And... I don't know what that means. Nobody knows what that means. Are we talking Hebrew? Are we talking Aramaic? Or are we talking Greek? Or what are we talking here? We don't know. Nobody knows. So it's, it's, 
I think it's placed in the scripture so those who are living during the time will be able to figure it out. But we can't use it as a predictor of who the Antichrist is going to be. Right? Number one, we don't know what numeric value John is assigning to the different numbers or different letters. Every culture in history has assigned numeric value to letters. I don't know. Don't get caught up on that. What is important is that the Antichrist has a statute of himself that people are to worship. And the second beast, the false prophet, is allowed to give breath to that statue. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean he's creating life? I don't believe so. I believe what it means, and it's becoming clear more and more every day, that it some, somehow is going to encompass artificial intelligence. Right? That we're creating artificial intelligence. And if you've seen the movie Terminator, you can see what happens when it gets loose. I don't know. I saw Elon Musk this past week with some little drones or something or making drinks at a bar or something, right? Somehow, there's an intelligence in the statue. I believe it's an artificial intelligence that the second beast places in there, and the second beast says, hey, I see who's what not worshiping me, and if you're not worshiping me, if you're not bound down to the statue of the Antichrist, then you're going to be put to death. And then, in order to facilitate that, he says, the Antichrist, through his statue, says you must take the mark, you must take my mark, and it's my name, it's the number of my name, so it's identifying who you're worshiping, it's identifying who you're putting your faith and trust into, you're putting his name on you, on your body. Now, is that going to be a tattoo? Is it going to be a skin implant? Is it, I don't know, and really don't care, because I'm saying very plainly, when it comes to taking the mark of the beast, you willingly do it. You, nobody's going to be tricked into taking the mark of the beast. You're going to willingly take the mark of the beast. And when you do that, you are making a final declaration, I don't want anything to do with Jehovah. I want to serve Satan. I want to serve Lucifer. I'm making a choice to choose to serve and be on the side of the Antichrist and Satan. So questions about that? I know that's always a hot topic, Mark of the Beast. I remember when barcodes first came out. Y'all, most of y'all are too young to remember when life before barcodes. Huh? Huh? No, barcode on products. I think the first one was chewing gum. I think it was Wrigley's gum. I could be wrong. Barcodes. Early in my military career, I had to go to, to Washington, D.C. to a conference on barcodes. They were trying to introduce barcodes into the supply system. And it was, it was fascinating. But anyhow, when, that, when they first came out, everybody's screaming, the mark of the beast, the mark of the beast, the mark of the beast. And it's just barcodes. Right? It's on every product sold now. No, it's not the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast is something we will choose to take. We will know exactly what it is, and we will choose to take it. I say we, we're not going to be here. Humankind will choose to take it. So, questions on that? All right. We want to move on to chapter 14. Then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. Now these possibly are the same 144,000 in chapter 7. We can't definitively state that. It could be a different group altogether. It doesn't really matter, I don't believe. Jesus is on Mount Zion with 144,000. I do believe they are the, seven, uh, the ones from seven, chapter 7, but... I'm not going to state that definitively. Uh, and, verse 2, he heard a voice from heaven, and I heard a voice from heaven, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. The voice I heard was like the sound of the harpist playing on their harps. And they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. It is they who... It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. 
These have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the Lamb, and in their mouth no lie was found, for they are blameless. So, they're virgins. Is that speaking uh, physically or is it speaking spiritually? I don't know. Spiritual, God often uses uh, sexual language to talk about our spiritual relationship with him, right? Israel is likened to an unfaithful wife, for instance. And prophet Hosea, if you read the prophet Hosea, what is Hosea told to do? God has Hosea marry a prostitute, an unfaithful prostitute. She's unfaithful to Hosea over and over again. But God has caused his servant to be in that relationship as a teaching tool to the nation of Israel that the nation of Israel is like the prostitute, Hosea's wife, who has been unfaithful to God over and over and over. So God has often uses that sexual language to talk about our our ability or inability to have a correct relationship with him. In other words, when we when we fall from God, when we stop serving God, when we turn to other gods, he says we're being immoral, we're sexually immoral in our relationship with God, right? So anthropomorphism, it's using human language to, to explain something about a non-human entity, right? In this case, God. God views our relationship with him in such intimate terms that the closest thing that we can understand as humans is unfaithfulness in a marriage, right? And how that can hurt you and how that can damage the relationship. That's how he views his relationship with us. So these 144,000 virgins uh, are the first fruits for God and the Lamb. And in their mouth no lie was found, for they are blameless. Why are they blameless? Why are you blameless? Why am I blameless? Because we're covered by the blood, right? They're blameless the same way we're blameless. And then we have the messages of the three angels. The messages of the three angels. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. He said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and the springs of water. So we have an angel flying through the air and John specifically says he's proclaiming the gospel in every language of the planet, right? This is clearly a supernatural happening here. People on earth are going to look up and there's an angel flying through the air proclaiming the gospel. He's proclaiming worship God. Worship the one who created it all because his judgment is coming. It's an offer of the gospel. It's turned to God because his judgment is coming. So God is not leaving himself without a witness during the tribulation period. He is proclaiming the gospel during the tribulation period. And another angel, a second, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen, is Babylon the great. She made all the nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. We will talk about who Babylon the Great is uh, later. But this is an angel proclaiming, again, in the implication is in all the languages of the nations, all the languages of the earth, that the kingdom of the Antichrist, the kingdom of the dragon, has fallen. This is a, pro, pro, a proclamation of the victory that is to come. In verse 9, And another angel of third followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast, remember John has just told us that the beast is demanding worship. And people are choosing to worship by getting his mark. And so here's God's response to that. If, if anyone worships the beast in its image and receives a mark on his forehead or its hand, he will also drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger. And he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb and the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night, these worshipers of the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. So, in chapter 14 and 13 are, are concurrent. They're happening at the same time. As the beast is making this image, as the beast is breathing, as the second beast is breathing the breath of whatever into the image, as the, the image is demanding worship, 
and putting to death those who refused to worship and causing everybody to get the mark. At the same time, these angels are flying through the air screaming, don't do it. Don't take the mark of the beast. If you take the mark of the beast, guess what's going to happen? You're going to taste God's wrath and you're going to suffer forever and ever and ever. You're going to hell if you take the mark of the beast. That's why I said it's not a surprise. People choose to defy God. God is sending these angels. Imagine this. We've got a statue who's telling people to take the mark and worship him, and we have an angel flying through the air saying, if you take the mark, you're going to suffer forever. God's wrath is going to be poured out on you, and you're going to suffer forever. So people have to make a choice. We've got an angel, clearly a supernatural being, flying through the atmosphere, speaking in everybody's language. Don't do it. Don't take the mark. And then you've got the statue saying, take the mark or you're going to die. So people have to make a choice. And the vast majority of them choose against God, even though God has given them all this evidence. And it's just like today. People, there's, there, there's plenty of evidence to be a Christian. Anybody can take an honest look at the Scripture and know there's enough evidence there to, to prove that God exists. There's enough evidence there to prove that Jesus is who he said he is, did what he said he was going to do, and who rose from the dead. The evidence is there. It's not a lack of evidence. I mean, you can look at creation and understand there's a God. It's a willful disobedience that mankind has in his heart against God. They choose against God. And it's never more plain than here in the tribulation period. Right? You cannot deny God has sent an angel to say, here's a warning, don't take the mark. Don't worship the beast and don't take his mark because if you do, I'm going to pour my wrath out on you and you're going to hell. So don't do it. And yet mankind does it anyhow in direct defiance. That was a couple chapters ago. Yeah. This, what we're in right now is a pause in the, in, the, in the timeline narrative that John had been giving and giving us some background that's going on. So these, these chapters can encompass both the first part of the tribulation and the second part of the tribulation. Okay, The war in heaven uh, happens in chapter 12. All right? So... In chapter 11, we got the two witnesses, which they, they split the two half of the tribulation period. But the second half of the tribulation period is called the Great Tribulation. And I think it's called that because the second half of the tribulation period, the second three and a half years, is when these great supernatural things begin to happen. Right? The first plagues, uh, the first judgments in the first half of the tribulation period can be attributed to man. We got war. We got famine resulting from that war. We got inflation resulting from that, right? So God uses mankind's evil to bring judgment upon mankind. But in the second half of the tribulation period, it's, you know, you've got angels flying, you've got magic locusts coming out of the abyss, you've got all this stuff that nobody has ever experienced before that is decidedly supernatural in origin, if that, if that makes sense. Verse 12, here's a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, blessed are the dead, the second of the seven blessings in the book of Revelation, if you're curious. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud and seated on the cloud was one like the Son of Man with a golden crown on his head. This is the Stephanos crown. It means he's an overcomer, a victor. Uh, with a golden crown on, typically Jesus wears a diadem, but here he's being portrayed as the victor, which is, that's what a Stephanos crown is, the victor's crown. On his head and a sharp sickle in his hand, another angel came out of the temple, calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud. Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come. 
for the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. So he who sat on the clouds swung his sickle across the earth, and the earth was reaped. Then another angel came out from the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, and the angel who has authority over the fire, and he called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle, Put in your sickle and gather the cluster of the wine from the earth, for its grapes are ripe. So the angel swung the sickle across the earth and gathered the grape harvest of the earth and threw it into the great wine press of the wrath of God. And the wine press was trodden outside the city, and the blood flowed from the wine press as high as a horse's bridle for 1,600 stadia. And I forget what that equates out to. I used to know it, how many miles that equates out to. This is telling us that there is going to be a great harvest of the earth. This is talking about John has seen a vision of what's going to happen at the Battle of Armageddon when God harvests the earth and fills up the great press of the wrath of God, right? So this is, again, this is a prelude where John is setting the precedent on what's going to happen when he resumes his chronological telling of the tale. So... Right, there's going to be, this is talking about the harvest of Armageddon, right? When the armies of the world come against Christ, when Christ comes back, right? We're going to get there, but yes, uh, that's all right, that's all right. Uh, yes, at the end of everything, not every Christian will have been martyred. Not every Jew will have been killed. All who survive, because the second harvest that you're talking about is at the end of the age. God wipes out everybody who's not a believer, right? So the Armageddon is where the armies uh, are going to be gathered at the at Har Megiddo. It's the Valley of Megiddo, huh? Yeah. And so we, we say Armageddon, but it's Armageddon. And there's going to be a great battle, except it's going to be over when Jesus speaks a word. And all the armies die. That's the first harvest. Then he's going to harvest the earth. Everybody is going to be gathered. And those who are not believers, those who have not come to put their faith in Christ, are going to be destroyed from the earth. Right? They're going to be sent to Hades. Then they're going to start the tribulation period. The tribulation, no, the, excuse me. The kingdom, the millennial kingdom will begin as Jesus, as the regent, Jesus is king from Jerusalem, sitting on David's throne, and all the inhabitants will be believers. For a thousand years, those believers are going to be having children, raising children, and they still have to be taught to believe in Jesus. Everybody comes to Christ the same way. Everybody experiences salvation the same way prior to the millennial kingdom or during the millennial kingdom. They have a responsibility to accept what Jesus did for them, right? He's going to be sitting on the throne. They're going to have this, us with resurrected bodies telling them what Jesus did, right? They're going to have their parents telling them. It's going to be a perfect environment. It's going right back to the garden state. Everybody will live in a remastered garden of Eden, the same, same environment that Adam and Eve had, the long ages are going to come back, right? It says if somebody dies at 100, it's going to be a tragedy because they died so young during the millennial reign. So, it, you know, the lion laying down with the lamb and all those things, that's talking about the millennial kingdom, right? The, the toddler playing with the, with the snake, and it's not going to be hurt because we're talking about the millennial kingdom. It's going to be a perfect environment. And what we see... As we go through this book, we're going to see that at the end of that thousand-year reign of Christ, where people can no longer complain, I can't see God. No, you can go to Jerusalem and speak to God. He's right there. At the end of that, the vast majority of humankind will once again rise up in rebellion against God. And then there's another great harvest there. And then we go to the white throne judgment. And, but we'll get there. All right. So Google says 
182? The number in my mind was 150, but I wasn't confident enough to say that. I'm glad I didn't. Your says what? Nearly 200. Nearly 200. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Gracious God, our King, Father, again, thank you for this day. Thank you for these who have gathered together. Help us, Father, to glorify you in our service today. And we ask all of this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, you got time for coffee.